Welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. Indie Alaska is an innovative weekly web series capturing the diverse and colorful lifestyle of Alaskans. Real stories of everyday Alaskans at work and play. Supported in part by Alaska Pipeline Service Company. That way we can see your message no matter who you're talking to. We'll know that you're talking about Alaska weather and we should pay attention. On YouTube, NWS Alaska can uh, show you this uh, uh, entire weather cast uh, during the daytime. You'll get your ma afternoon map briefing around 4 o'clock or so that we'll talk about with our service weather here shortly. And of course, after this show on our broadcast partner, alaskapublic.org, on the bottom right-hand side of your page, you'll see this entire broadcast and you can find it on YouTube. Search for AKWX TV and just look at it there or on your smartphone. Now, off to the Bering Sea, and things are changing out there. In fact, if you're on the West Coast, you probably have already had at least a couple rounds of that change pass through. One of those waves is working in from the north and west as we go ahead in time. Uh, circulation here just south of the Gulf of Anadir is pushing a frontal boundary closer and closer to the West Coast. With that, in the front and the moisture ahead of it, there's going to be some more snow, and there's going to be some colder air that follows it. Behind it, another system out here coming in uh, from west to east is picking up the southerly flow across the western and central Aleutians as we go into the mid to late week now. And with that, we also have more moisture that will spread further northward and continue to offer up the northwest and uh, areas around Norton Sound, maybe the northern Yukon Delta. More possibility of snow going into the weekend and perhaps even earlier next week. For the rest of us, as we go through the rest of this weekend and into next week, the overall pattern is shifting to one that will be colder. It looks like there's a wealth of cold air that is starting to move southward there. And uh, dare we say a return to winter for some places, but it kind of looks like it might get a little bit colder around here. For south central, you can see a weak area of low pressure sitting across the northern gulf, just kind of sloshing moisture up against the Chugach and uh, the Kenai Peninsula. Across southeast, still got a southerly flow coming in from Sitka down toward the Dixon entrance. And for areas across the west coast, a broad southerly flow has a very narrow channel of moisture out ahead of that frontal boundary that's crossing from west to east. And again, in some of these areas, you may see some periods of uh, precipitation. Some of it could be warm enough to be all rain, but the further north you go into the Bristol Bay region, chances are that will be rain and snow. But the further north you go still up into the Brooks Range, this is going to be snow and there will be some accumulations there. Uh, probably several waves coming past your region as we head into the next three, five, even seven days ahead. So plan for snow if you're in Nome, and that's probably a good thing to hear. As we look at today's weather map, there's the low pressure system, kind of the sloppy one that's throwing up low clouds into the Kenai Mountains and uh, also into Prince William Sound and at times over south central. For southeast, an occlusion 
uh, continues to work its way from southwest to northeast and uh, some light rainfall uh, expected across southeastern Alaska again as we head into tonight. Across the west coast, a frontal boundary there across the northern parts of the Bering Sea at 996 millibars. The front crossing through the uh, central and eastern Aleutians and across the northern parts of the Alaska Peninsula, across the uh, coast area, I should say, around the Bering. Some light snow was seen across the southern tip of the peninsula there. One front again is working its way toward the lower and middle Yukon Valley. As it does that, we're seeing a few areas of snow pop up here and there. Around Kotzebue Sound, uh, also a little bit of snow. And then high pressure develops across the northern coastal plain just east of Barrow and around Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse. That's at around 114 millibars. The good thing about this is it's pushing some of the stronger winds a little bit further east. So we're not seeing the tremendous amount of wind that we were talking about just a couple days ago. So good news there. In the meantime, uh, there is possibility that as that falls apart, the winds will pick up a little bit more and you might get some occasional blowing snow out there. But right now we have no watchers or warnings present across Alaska. Everything out there is just uh, talking about gales out in the west. Now as we look out across Norton Sound and out towards St. Lawrence Island, low pressure at 107 milli or 1,007 millibars will continue tracking eastward through tonight. Uh, the northwesterly flow coming into the eastern chain should bring some periods of rain and rain mixed with snow across uh, places like Dutch Harbor and Unalaska and the southern peninsula. Low pressure continues to dawdle in the northern gulf and again sloppy conditions may be seen from time to time. More clouds and fog in Cook Inlet and south central than anything else. Across the interior, snow may be possible across the middle Tanana Valley and the surrounding higher terrain as low pressure kind of puts on the brakes there as it crosses the Yukon Valley. And as we get into Thursday, it will still hover around the middle Yukon Valley. There may be some occasional gusts from time to time closer to the front and across the Arctic coast. But overall, the instability of this low pressure system will probably create some snow showers in many areas across the interior and west across Norton Sound, across the upper Kuskokwim Valley, and even across the middle Tanano Valley. And across the west, a much stronger storm is working up the eastern coastline of Russia at 983 millibars. This occlusion will be working past the eastern and central chain, the triple point just north of the islands. With that comes a better chance for rain and probably some winds. Southerlies may come up to about 40 to 45 knots at times in places there. Uh, rain mixed with snow showers possible around the Priblovs. And we're talking about just plain old rain across southeast coming back into your region with a fairly elongated area of low pressure out across the north and eastern gulf. And it also drops into uh, the western gulf, uh, kind of wraps around almost in on itself. As we get into Friday, the occlusion and its front is more working itself into western Alaska. With this will come more wind. Out ahead of it, a fairly mild situation. There will probably see an opportunity for that rain and snow to move a little bit further northward. But behind it, a pretty decent shot for some moderate to occasionally heavy snow across the west coast. And once again, we've said Nome. Nome looks like a pretty good opportunity for uh, some accumulating snow. You've got about 12 inches on the ground right now. And with the dogs and the mushers got their eyes on Nome once again, uh, yeah, some new snow may be welcome across western parts of Alaska. Out ahead of this system, we're looking at more showery weather as the moisture fills in and makes that snow situation a little more possible. Initially, we'll be dealing with kind of scattered showers from here and there, uh, blowing snow possible across some of the Arctic coast. And the strongest of winds probably a little bit further back. So uh, St. Matthew down toward the Priblovs and west will be watching for some stronger winds coming in from the west and northwest. So Mariners, if you're heading to that area or plan on making some trips out there heading toward the weekend, expect the winds to come up in that region for sure. Now as we look out across the eastern gulf, you can see another wave kind of lifting northward a little bit here. Uh, most areas out ahead of that are going to be fairly dry, so the rain should actually pull back away from southeastern Alaska by Friday, Friday night. We'll still have some snow showers across the Wrangell St. Elias and around Haines and Skagway and points northward into the southern Yukon and the Copper River Valley. But a lot of places down south may get a little bit of a break, so still some clouds, but maybe not as wet there for areas around the Dixon entrance to Klawak and Metlakatla and up toward maybe even Port Alexander. That's a quick look at the surface weather. Let's see what happened today. Across southeast, 30s and 40s for many. 42 around Sitka, 39 in Juneau, mid 40s the further south you go toward the Dixon entrance and Clarence Strait. I look like 37 in Hyder, 44 around Yakutat, 30s and 40s for Prince William Sound today. Cordova was a pleasant 44. 38 degrees around Kenai, uh, 37 in Anchorage today. The Susitna Valley wasn't too far behind. 
35 around Fairbanks, 42 in Healy and around the Denali National Park, 33 in Fort Greeley, 25 for Fort Yukon, and Eagle is showing 28. 7 in Arctic Village, 10 in Anaktuvik Pass. Uh, most areas across the Arctic coast today were sub-zero, so 5 to about 10, even 15 below. Akasuk was 12 below. Kotzebue was showing 7 degrees above zero with 3 below at Tin City, 15 above. As you look at uh, Nome, 19 in Unilaclead, McGrath had 37 degrees with Galena at 25. Ambler and Bettles both in the teens today, 36 in, or 23 in Grayling, 36 around Sparavon. And as you get out toward Nunavak Island, it was 28 degrees with St. Mary's at 25. The Bristol Bay temperatures were in the lower to mid 30s today. Dillingham was a little bit colder than King Salmon at 40 in St. Paul, 38 in St. George with the peninsula generally in the mid 30s today. Most areas above freezing there. Kodiak Island in the lower 40s, 41 for Dutch Harbor, Unalaska, and upper 30s from Shemya eastward toward Adak and Aka, both at 39 degrees respectively. Now tonight's low temperatures will stay above freezing for many across southeastern Alaska. For south central, it will go below except for Homer and Seward, where temperatures could be a little bit milder. 38 in Kodiak, low to mid-30s for the Alaska Peninsula and most of the chain, 32 in St. Paul. Southwest in the YK Delta, generally in the lower 20s there, especially as you get north of Bethel. Teens for Norton Sound, 10 around Nome, 2 below in Kotzebue, and 15 below for uh, places around Barrow and eastward. It could get even colder around Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse, 20 below. Mid-teens around the middle Tananaw Valley, and as we get into tomorrow, look for temperatures to hover near the freezing point there in Fairbanks. South Central, including Matsu, uh, looks like most areas there in the upper 30s. Uh, the Kenai Peninsula generally in the mid-30s. 41 in Kodiak, close to 40 for the Alaska Peninsula and Bristol Bay, and westward for southeast, lower to mid-40s from Juneau all the way out towards Sitka and Ketchikan and Annette should all be fairly mild tomorrow. Now the Seward Peninsula, we're looking at teens uh, generally in the north side, uh, upper teens and low 20s around Nome and into Norton Sound. The Arctic coast should see temperatures from 5 to about 10 below, including Barrow and Kaktovik, both around 6 to 8 below, so another cold day there. Here's a look at your flying weather, and IFR conditions should be expected for St. Lawrence Island and the northern sections of the YK Delta out across the western chain as well ahead of the next storm. Otherwise, it's MVFR for southeast all the way up into Prince William Sound with patchy areas of MVFR. Most of the Cook Inlet region and westward should experience VFR conditions for at least a good time tomorrow. And for areas along the Yukon Valley, most of you will be under MVFR conditions through at least some part of the day. Here's your past conditions. Anaktuvik Pass, we expect to lean over toward MVFR. Similar conditions are expected for Adigan Pass tomorrow starting at VFR. Lake Clark may stay at VFR all day long, but you may see a trend toward MVFR conditions for Merrill Pass. Same goes for Rainy Pass. Watch for MVFR to develop during the day, as well as Windy Pass on your Thursday. Isabel Pass, we expect MVFR throughout the afternoon hours, and Mentasta Pass may hold at MVFR through most of your Thursday. Tanita Pass, we expect MVFR to start your Thursday morning, and then a gradual shift over toward MVFR conditions throughout the day. Portage Pass right now looks to maintain VFR. And Chilkoot and White Pass also expecting to see some improvements as we get through your Thursday. Your freezing levels show that warm air is not quite as deep and entrenched across the eastern Gulf as it has been earlier this week, but we still have warmer air pushing westward up across the eastern Kenai Peninsula and Kodiak Island region and also across the west, west central Aleutians, anywhere from two to 6,000 feet there. The surface freezing line north of the Pribilovs and just south of St. Matthew and the island waters there. The icing potential shows that most areas across the interior will at least have some light to isolated moderate tomorrow, especially mid to late afternoon above 3,000 feet. Across southeast, you'll also see a better chance than normal for some light to occasional moderate. Uh, looks like most of that will be above 3,000 feet. Out to the west, you'll have to go a little bit higher above 5,000 feet, but from Kiska to Attu, maybe even eastward to Atka, you could find some light to even occasional moderate from time to time ahead of that new weather system. The jet stream shows that a pronounced trough of low pressure sitting across the Gulf is stirring up the winds coming into southeast. That's around 100 knots there on that main corridor of weather. Out across the west, high pressure is nudging northward, and as it does that, it's taking the most active weather and allowing that to reach into Norton Sound and places like the Seward Peninsula and even the interior. As that matches up or phases with some of the colder air and that fast track of weather, we get that more active weather pattern reaching the interior. As this finally drops southward a little bit more, we'll have a much better chance to open the door to the cold that's been heading into the central and eastern parts of the lower 48. So this is a system that we're watching. We're seeing how this develops, and we're thinking at this point that cold door might open up again. As we get to the 9,000-foot level, you can see the westerlies crossing through the Yukon Valley. 
uh, anywhere from 20 to 30 knots there. Again, pretty much west to east. A south and westerly flow comes into the panhandle anywhere from 25 to 50 knots. We have a broad west and southwesterly flow making its way into the Bering Sea. Some of the strongest winds well west and north of Shemya at 80 knots. At 3,000 feet, that circulation across the northern Gulf is pretty entrenched there. Wind speeds are pretty light, but you get into some faster winds as you get west of the Aleutian Range. Look for a westerly flow to remain fairly light across the northern parts of southeast. Considerably stronger, though, as you get toward the Dixon entrance, a southwesterly flow at 40 knots there. There's our westerlies again coming in off the Arctic and out of the northern Bering Sea, 15 to about 20 knots. We have a little bit of a northeasterly flow feeding into low pressure for the eastern Beaufort Sea Coast. Uh, most of the flow crossing through the region, though, is a west flow and again stronger winds out across the western Bering Sea. Turbulence potential right now. We're not seeing any major flags or issues for tomorrow. I would watch for some isolated conditions across the lower to middle Yukon as that dying frontal boundary is working through there. The main issues will be out in the west below 4,000 feet. Watch for some occasional moderate there in the Aleutians and some isolated chop across the eastern chain and the southern tip of the Alaska Peninsula and just a little bit outside of southeastern Alaska down the British Columbia coastline. That's a look at your aviation forecast. I'll be back in just a few minutes with your marine weather. Stay Only six years after the Latuya Bay tsunami, all of Alaska would witness the strongest earthquake ever to strike North America. Measured at between 8.6 and 9.2 on the Richter scale, the quake hit on Good Friday, March 27, 1964. We received this report through the city manager here in Anchorage that both the oil tanks and docks are on fire at Seward. Coastal communities like Seward, 126 miles south of Anchorage on Resurrection Bay off Prince William Sound, sustained the most damage. That's because the most powerful earthquake in America was followed by tsunamis. And everything was split seconds. There really wasn't time to to sit and discuss what our options were because there were no options. The options were um, survive. Linda McCray McSwain of Seward was 15 years old when nature altered life as she knew it. A night of terror started at the dinner table. The first sign of trouble was just the house started shaking and very, very quickly it became uh, very, very strong and it just would not stop. It continued and continued and continued and it always reminded me of Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz where just something giant was happening. The McCrays lived here, a modest house on a hill above Resurrection Bay. They were high enough they could have stayed home and been safe. But eight people piled in the car and started downhill to check on family members. They had less than an hour. We drove out to the head of the bay, got to the Lima's house, and it was empty. But my dad and brother wanted to go back into town to fight fire because all the standard oil drums were on fire. And from out um, where we are, it looked like the, the city was completely on fire. The water was burning. They had driven to a subdivision away from downtown, what is now near the airport. Two neighbors had climbed a crane to get a better look at Seward on fire. What they saw was far more frightening. Within a minute or two, my dad and brother were back in the house and my dad was screaming, and this was not a man that ever raised his voice, and he was screaming, there's a wave coming, there's a tidal wave coming, we have to get to the top of the house. Using an oil drum for a ladder, Linda and her family, including a three-week-old baby and a little dog in her mother's coat, jumped onto the roof. They could then see what her dad could not. Prom was the next night, so he was bringing all of my things, but all the rest of the family, we were now on the top of the roof and could see the wave coming down the bay, and it was um, a huge wave, a dark, threatening wave, a huge and enormous wall of water coming right towards us. And we all laid down and had our heads at the highest uh, part of the roof, and my dad was the last one to jump. and. As soon as my dad hit that roof, this wave just hit with a vengeance, just, just power that is just unimaginable. The tsunami turned the roof into a family-sized surfboard. The instant that it hit, we were just popped up to the top of that wave, just like a cork. Um, so the house was totally torn off of its foundation, and it happened to be the only house, the only structure in the neighborhood that, that did survive the wave. The entire subdivision just was flattened and floated right by us. So now we were at the top of that wave. Um, 
and we were spinning at the top of the trees and it was a wild, wild ride. Remember, this was March in Alaska. It was cold, dark, and they were expecting snow. We were wet, um, but nobody was swept off the roof. Nobody was speared with uh, a tree branch. We were really quiet. Um, it wasn't hysterical or out of control, and we spun around for, I would imagine, I don't know, seemed like a long time, maybe 15, 20 minutes, and then we ended up way at the back of the subdivision back uh, where the rivers uh, come into Seward, and we just jammed into uh, a strand of trees and just sort of, you know, just did a big jolt. The earthquake and tsunamis crushed the economy in this thriving port city. Linda's scraped knees and the McCrae family's amazing story of survival made headlines in the Anchorage Daily Times. Linda eventually went to the prom with the man she would marry. She finished high school in Seward, went away to college, and now lives in Anchorage. She says no one really talked much about their earthquake and tsunami experiences, but a discovery last year brought it all back. I knew that my parents had taken um, a lot of pictures after the quake, but I knew that, that we had never watched them because people were very busy rebuilding Seward and getting on with their lives. And then last year, I um, found them, and when I opened them, I couldn't believe my good fortune that they were in perfect condition. It brought everything back in the, the big, bigger than life colors that I wanted to see, the, the oversized everything, seeing huge fishing boats sitting up in meadows here, police cars being smashed like kids' toys. I was never really able to describe the enormous, everything was just oversized and just giant sized and those pictures brought it all back. This lone stone structure is the only evidence that people used to live out here. The earthquake dropped the elevation of the land. It's now swampy and no longer suitable for building. Some residents had to leave Seward to find work. Many stayed, though survivors now see coastal living differently. People love Seward. This is their home. They, they love this town, and it's, and it's a town to be loved. It's, it's everybody's hometown, so I am not afraid to be in Seward. I mean, I have land right down on the water. would love to live on the water. But there's certainly a respect. We know that there were a number of lives lost here, and we also know that many of us are just very lucky to be here. Here's your forecast now for southeast Alaska's marine weather. A northerly flow coming down the Lynn Canal, fairly light with only a two-foot sea expected in most of the inner waterways. A 20-knot wind coming in across Clarence Strait with a four-foot sea there. Otherwise, light winds out the outer coastline tend to as high as 20 knots as you get up towards Yakutat. A seven-foot sea is expected there. For Friday, we remain fairly light. A little bit of a stronger flow across the Lynn Canal coming in from the south with four-foot seas there, three-foot seas from Clarence Strait northward up through Stevens Passage. A light southerly flow for most areas on the outer coastline. We'll have a little bit more of an offshore flow, though, coming out of Craig and the Dixon entrance with a six-foot sea expected to wrap up the week. For South Central, look for a light and variable wind and small seas in the north in the ice-free waters. Westerly is coming off the mountains, though, and coming into Kenai. And the coastal plain there, look for a northwesterly flow crossing the Barrens, 15 knots with a 4 to 5 foot sea. Westerlies crossing Kodiak Island and northeasterlies coming through Prince William Sound and the western Gulf. Look for an easterly flow outside of Monty Dew Island, uh, 20 knot wind there with a 7 foot sea. That becomes southerly as we get into Friday. A light easterly wind continues inside of Prince William Sound. 4 to 5 foot seas for most in the western Gulf, 6 foot seas east of Kodiak. Westerlies continue to blow into the Barren Islands at 25 knots with a 6-foot sea and south and westerly flow coming up the Cook Inlet with 2 to 3-foot seas there on Friday. For the Alaska Peninsula, 20 to 25 knots in most areas, 4-foot seas inside of Bristol Bay, 14-foot seas down the coast, and 6 to 9-foot seas there south of Cascal Cape all the way out toward King Cove. For Friday, the flow reverses to more of a south and westerly flow, 25 to 30 knots there in most areas, 7 to 12-foot seas in the Bering, and 6 to 8-foot seas in the Pacific to wrap up the week there. For the eastern chain, a northwesterly flow at 35 knots on both sides. Look for 17 to 18 foot seas in the north and 13 to 16 foot seas in the Bering side. Uh, 14 to 16 foot seas there for the central chain, looking at more of a southerly flow and slightly stronger winds as you head out to the west from Kiska to Attu at 40 knots. The wind should diminish a little bit more on Friday with a southwesterly flow moving all the way east toward Nikolski. We'll get into more westerlies north of Unalaska and uh, south. Uh, they're still looking at a southwesterly flow. 
at 30 knots with a 10 foot sea as high as 16 feet south of Adak and Atka and even higher still for Kiska and Attu with seas in the bearing generally around 14 feet. For the west coast, north and westerly winds will be predominant around St. Lawrence Island, 20 knots there with a westerly flow for the Pribilovs, a 17-foot sea there at 14 feet west of St. Matthew with that northwesterly wind at 30 knots. That becomes southwesterly on Friday. Same goes for the Pribilovs with a 15-foot sea there. Seas as high as 18 feet around St. Matthew and southerlies coming into the Kuskokwim Bay region and continuing northward to as high as 35 knots around St. Lawrence Island. Easterlies will be fairly light across the Beaufort Sea Coast, past Point Barrow, and then becoming northerly as they round the curve there around Point Hope and northwesterly into Kotzebue Sound at 15 knots. For Friday, we continue that easterly push, still fairly light, a little bit stronger now west of Wainwright for Friday, and also outside of Kotzebue Sound, easterly winds up to 25 knots. That's a look at your marine forecast. Let's continue again with our surface weather. Our frontal boundary is working into the west coast. With that, we should expect some snow showers in most areas there. A front is also dropping southward into the Yukon Valley. And for the interior, that means an opportunity for some light and accumulating snow. Around the northern Gulf, a weak area of low pressure will continue to spin, kind of slosh some weather up against the mountains, the Kenai Peninsula, and the Chugach there. It doesn't look like we'll see anything terribly heavy, but it does look kind of sloppy, and we'll keep the low clouds around for a while. For southeast, periods of light rain will be back as we head into tonight and tomorrow. That should pick up a little bit more with more of a south and westerly flow, pushing some moisture into your region. A ridge of high pressure slowing the onslaught of the next weather system into the western bearing, but it's going to move in anyway at 983 millibars. This one will be a little bit stronger with stronger winds across the western chain, a better chance of rainfall there. Showers of snow continue across the lower Yukon and Kuskokwim Delta and up across the Brooks Range, a slightly better chance for some breezy conditions and maybe some blowing snow. Look for a chance for rain and snow as we head into south central, certainly by uh, late tonight and into tomorrow, a better chance of that developing from west to east, especially as the frontal boundary crosses over uh, the western coast and into Bristol Bay. Look for some stronger winds and a better chance for accumulating snow across the Seward Peninsula and in places like Nome as we head into the weekend. That's a look at your Alaska weather. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder. Thanks for joining. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service.